As we have been talking about worship in the first quarter of this year, we have said it from the very beginning, worship is one of the most difficult, grand things that we can achieve on this earth. I said difficult, not impossible. We do not worship on accident. It takes concentration. It takes, uh, you, you don't do it on accident. You do it on purpose. And one of the things that makes it difficult is the challenge of remembering the purpose of worship. I want you to wake up and listen to this first statement because I don't want anybody misunderstanding what I'm saying or misquoting me from this statement here. If the only reason that you have for worshiping is because you feel like you have to because God commanded it, you're missing out on the grand purpose of worship. Yes, we do do it. It is a reason that we worship because God commanded it. But we have so many other reasons to worship God. There is purpose in our worship. If the only reason you come to worship God is because you are commanded to, then you will feel adequate by coming here, sitting here, listening every once in a while, and then leaving this place, having not been challenged, having not been changed by what took place in that worship service. But if we can remember the purpose of our worship, it will always, always, always be more fulfilling. In the Old Testament, you've heard probably many preachers say this statement, and I think it's a wonderful thing to think about. You could always follow the faithful children of God in the Old Testament from the smoke from their altars. In other words, you could look out in the distance and you could see the smoke coming from their altars and you knew there would be faithful people of God. Altar in the Old Testament was a place of slaughter. It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place where blood was shed. It acknowledged an approaching of, to God. It, it was an acknowledgement. It was, I'm approaching you, God, in this. It was thanksgiving. It was worship. If you think about Job, the patriarch, who on the day when tragedy struck his life, what was he doing? He was out offering a sacrifice on the altar in case one of his children had sinned. What do we find that Noah did after leaving the ark? What did he do? He built an altar and he made a sacrifice and the smoke went up as a sweet savor unto God. I want you to get your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to just look at four places. We're going to follow the smoke in Abraham's life, the smoke from the altar. And we're going to see on what occasion he offered sacrifices on these altars. And although we don't butcher animals today as part of our worship, we don't actually light a fire and sacrifice them on an altar. I think we'll see that the purpose of Abraham's worship, what compelled him to worship is still ours today for reasons, but only for of many reasons we have to worship God. Number one, in Genesis chapter 12, we find that God makes his promise to Abram, a passage we're probably very familiar with. He said to Abram, verse 1, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him that curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice he was not just the subject of the blessing, but he was also a medium of the blessing. He would be blessed but through him, all nations of the earth would also be blessed. And we can't emphasize the importance of this promise enough. It wasn't fulfilled only in Abraham, but it had more far-reaching results and goals in mind. It was to be fulfilled, as the New Testament tells us in Galatians chapter 3, 
that the seed is Christ. In thy seed, in you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, how? By Christ. But had Abram not done what he did, you see, he served as a medium through whom all these blessings would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. And so what was he asked to do? He was asked to leave his home, leave his family to a land that he will show him. Verse 5, he takes Sarah hit and Lot, his brother's son, and they leave and they continue to go and they go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Now watch verse 6. And Abram passed through the land in the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. And so he leaves his home. He leaves his family. He leaves his land and he comes to Canaan. And what does it tell us? It tells us that the Canaanites were in that land. And you might think, well, obviously you're in Canaan and there's going to be Canaanites there. Well, you have to remember, these Canaanites were corrupt, vile, unloving, wicked people. And he's coming now into their land. If you would think of the worst enemy of the United States, whatever that is, in other words, once they find out that you're American, your name is mud. And you go to the borders of their land as an American, dressed in an American flag clothing, <laughs> so they're going to know who you are. You're, you're a stranger. You're an outsider. You don't belong here. You come to that border of a country that hates you and that really hates everybody except themselves. You come into that country. How are you going to feel as you are now getting ready to enter into that country? The Canaanites dwelt there and here Abram is with his little family getting ready to enter that land. What did Abram do? Look at verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. What does he do? He approaches the land. He's getting ready to enter the land that belongs to somebody else. The anxiety no doubt is high. And God appears to him and said, Abram, I will remind you of something. I told you I would give you this land. I'm still going to give it to you and your descendants. I'm going to keep my promise. What does Abram do? Look at the last part of chapter or verse 7. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God spoke to him. What did he do? He built an altar. He built an altar. God communicated with him, and so he built an altar. And you notice what he did. Look at the last part. And there he built an altar to himself. Is that what it says? He built an altar to the Lord. Where is praise always directed? To the Lord. Have you ever heard someone say, well, you know what? I used to go to worship, but I just didn't get anything out of it. Because you were going the wrong direction. Where was the praise directed? It was directed to the Lord. And he praised God. That's the first altar. It was an altar of praise. And why did he praise God? Because God revealed his promise and his will to him that it drove him to build an altar and worship God. It wasn't Abram's imagination. It was the revelation from God that caused him to want to worship. The promises of God revealed to us in Scripture or even the fact that they were even revealed to us should cause us to praise God and worship. Who are you that the God of heaven would tell you his plans? Have you ever been in a situation where somebody who may not know nearly as much about a situation 
as you do, whatever it could be. It could be in the kitchen, it could be on the road, it could be, you know, at your job, or, or just whatever it is. And somebody who does not know nearly as much as you know about a certain situation begins to question you. <laughs> What are you doing now? 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 I can just imagine how well that would go over in the kitchen if Mindy were making a great recipe. We'll just say red curry because it's awesome. And I ask her, is that the way you do it? What are you going to do next? You sure you ought to do that next? Where, where, where are you going with this step? How long do you think it would take her to say, listen, you either get out or you're not eating this tonight? <laughs> Or, if you want to know so much, why don't you just take over and do it yourself? That's probably what she would say first, I would guess. Who are you that God would even dare tell you, here's what I'm doing, here is my plan, here is the purpose, and here's what's going to happen to you if you obey my will. Here, it's all laid out for you. We don't come here and worship on a guess. We come here to worship because it's been revealed to us. If we do this, then this is what we receive. It's not based on guesswork. It's based on promises. And that ought to cause us to praise God and worship. That's a purpose to worship God on the altar of praise. Number two, starting now in verse eight, very next verse. God spoke to him, but now watch what happens. He, talking about Abram, he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. So he moves from the lowlands now to the mountain of Bethel, east of Bethel. Bethel means house of God. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Ai means house of ruins. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So what happened? Caused him to build the first altar? God talked to him. What's causing him to build the second altar? Abram now wants to talk to God. You have the altar of praise because God spoke to him. And now you have an altar of prayer because now Abram wants to speak to God. And you notice his progress. He, he moves away from the lowlands to a mountain. He pitches his tent there, and incidentally, his tent will characterize his life for the rest of the remaining of his life. He's always on the move. You want to know where he is? You just follow the smoke from the altar. He passed through, verse 6. He moved, verse 8. He journeyed, verse 9. He talked to God, God, what do I do now? Don't, go, don't, don't stay around here. There's going to be a famine in the land. You need to get down to Egypt. He preserved him. God, give me direction. Where do I go now in my life? And everywhere God told him to go, he went. Why? Because he was looking not for a city with foundations, but a city that had no foundations, whose builder and maker was God. The book of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 11, verse 10. But notice where his tent was, what was there? There was an altar. And the altar was to call on the name of the Lord because of what he was facing. Famine, dealing with Pharaoh, all of these things. And even in Abram's folly, God intervenes with him in Pharaoh's account. And I ask this question, and I don't know the answer. But I wonder how many times God has intervened has worked on my behalf. And not just because I've called on him to do that, but because others have called on him on my behalf. Now, I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know this. The first thing I'm going to do when a serious illness comes into my life as I'm going to call the church office and I'm going to ask them would you please put me on the prayer list and I'm not going to do that just so my name will be in the bulletin I'm going to do that because 
I'm going to be praying about my situation. And I want as many other faithful people doing the same for me. And I just wonder, through the providence of God, how many times God has put people in my life, given me things that I needed that I didn't even know that I needed, simply because either I called on him or others called on him on my behalf. And then when I think that God would listen to anybody who would pray for me, let alone me, that ought to drive you to worship him. There should be an altar. Wherever my dwelling place is, because I know this is true, Jeremiah 10, verse 23, it's not in me to direct my own steps. I need help. And he gives it. Number three, altar of praise, altar of prayer. And then Genesis chapter 13, starting with verse 14, we know what has taken place in this because God has blessed Abram and not just Abram, but all those who were blessing Abram, God also blessed. So that's Lot and his family because they were being blessed so much. Their herds just grew tremendously that the land was not able to bear them all. And so there was a strife that developed between the herdmen of Lot and the herdmen of Abram. And it was a great strife. And... Abram, as you remember, said, Lot, you choose whichever way you choose, I'll go the other way. Now, that's just putting it in basic terms, but that's in essence what happened. And so they did that. And now read with me verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. What did he do? And he built an altar there to the Lord. Where did he build this altar and why did he build this altar? What occasion? There was just this great strife. Peace occurred and it caused him to build an altar and worship God. When peace was restored, Abram built an altar and he worshiped God. The peace we enjoy as children of God <laughs> to drive us to worship. And we say these things, and I know that we probably mean it when we say it, but sometimes, just like any other phrase, it can just become more of a slogan than us really thinking about what we're saying. But sometimes you hear people say, I do not know what I would do without the Lord. And that is so much more than just a trite slogan. I really don't know what I would do without the Lord. If we just take it as this very fundamental, basic fact, and we just look at our country alone, and we see the things that are now happening in our country. And we shouldn't be shocked. It's been happening for years. But I watch things on television. I say, how? How can people think this way? 
How can, how can you not see through this? How can we have 29 different genders? And I look at this and I'm thinking, how can people not see? And that can be said about so many other things that are happening in this world right now. And if I was only thinking about that, you know where it would drive me? It would drive me insane. If I didn't know how it was all going to end. This country is not my home. If I'm faithful, heaven will be my home. And there's not a thing, any president, any congressman, any senator, any enemy can do to change that. Amen. Those of you who have stood besides the grave of the person you love the most, how would you do it if you didn't have that hope? We're going to be together again. There's only one thing that can truly, truly give us peace. And it's God. That should drive us to worship. And then last and not least, Genesis 22. We've seen his altar of praise, his altar of prayer, an altar of peace. But then we see an altar of provision. This is probably the most famous chapter when talking about Abraham. Because it's just so shocking, so devastating in one way for Abraham. But in the first couple verses, you remember what happened. You remember that promised son, Isaac? God says, you know, that one I promised, <laughs> the son of promise. You take him and you offer him as a sacrifice. Abram, Abraham rises up early in the morning, takes a couple servants with him. He leaves the servants, said, y'all stay here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, watch this, and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. His son carries the wood. Abraham carries the fire. And Abraham carries a knife. Verse 7, Isaac says, incidentally, he's old enough to carry wood and he's old enough to figure out that something's different with this sacrifice. He says, my father, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together and they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, if you've read the book of Hebrews, you might already be thinking, well, he expected, as the Hebrew writer tells us, that God was going to raise Isaac up from the dead. And I agree. But still, to have to go through that process, even if he did have the faith, that even after I kill him, God's going to raise him up from the dead. He's got to because this is my son of promise. 
God keeps his promises and he, he promised me this son and he said this is the seed through whom all these promises are going to come true so he's got to raise him from the dead and you might be thinking well it's no big deal he knew he's going to raise him from the dead oh yeah to have to go through that process even if you believed he was going to raise him from the dead Wouldn't that be horrible? It'd be horrible for Abraham. It'd be horrible for Isaac. But then, verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket but it, by its horns. So Abraham went, took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. There's that altar. God provided a lamb in Isaac's place. And so he takes that lamb. He sacrifices it on the altar. And I want to ask you this question. Do you think that day. That Abraham had ever been more thankful for a goat in all of his life. I've seen a lot of goats. Some look better than others, but you know what? I've never said, man, I would sure love to have that goat. <laughs> you think Abraham was ever more happy to see a, a ram in all of his life than he was that one that was caught in the thicket? Why? Because that ram was going to die in the place of his son. I would suggest to you that as Abraham killed that ram, dressed that ram, prepared that ram, put it on the altar, and sacrificed it, he had never been more grateful for a ram than he was on that day. And it drove him to worship. How much more should we be grateful? Because Jesus Christ took our place on the cross and died in your stead. Shall we not praise him for that? That song that Jeremy led us in, Corinne's favorite song, It Is Well With My Soul. That third verse, and maybe just because I knew what I was going to be preaching, really stuck out with me. And I could almost see Mr. Spafford as he was writing this. My sin, and then there's a hyphen. He stops. My sin. Just consider your sin. And then he stops and he thinks, almost a parenthetical statement, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin. And then again he starts thinking, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
O my soul. Why do we worship? Because Jesus took your place and died for you. Oh, I don't get anything out of worship. Then you've forgotten why you worship. Praise God. Because he's spoken to us. Praise God. Because he hears our prayers. Praise God. For he gives us a peace that we can find nowhere else than in our Lord. And then praise God. Because he provided the Lamb of God to die in your stead. Praise him. This morning it might be that you want to take advantage of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Yes, there are some things that you must do in order to take advantage of that. The Lamb himself tells us what to do. The one who took your place said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. He said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. He tells you to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The thing that cost him his life he wants you to, for it to cost you your life, not your physical life, but the life that you were living is going to change because of that confession. And then Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, he wants you to do for him what he did for you. Just as he died, was buried, and rose again, the old you will die, will bury him, and a new creature will walk in newness of life in baptism. Your sins are washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen. Then spend the rest of your life praising God for what he has done for you. Or if at one time you have obeyed the gospel, but you've gone back into the world. Have you forgotten the purpose? Have you forgotten your purpose? Praise God for giving you this chance to come and make it right while together we stand and sing. Yeah, that's all. Why will you linger on?